Today I f ed up by watching my neighbors fight while I was eating popcorn. So I'm a bit of a soccer fan, and today two big local teams had a game, so naturally I was watching the match on my living room. Little did I know there was another match going on my neighbor's house. About ten minutes into my game, I started hearing screams coming from the house across the street. Between the game and the distance between us, I really couldn't distinguish any words, so I just raised the volume of my TV and kept watching. During halftime I got a bit hungry and decided to make myself some popcorns. For those of you who don't watch sports, Half times tend to be a bit long and is just a bunch of commercials, so I lower the volume of the TV as I microwave some popcorn. By this point, my neighbors had been fighting for about 30 minutes, and just as I take the popcorns out of the microwave, I hear some doors slamming. Curiosity got the better of me, so I went to my balcony to see what was the scope of the fight in case I had to call the cops of something. Now I have two dogs, so I didn't want to leave my popcorn bag unattended on the couch, so I brought it with me. So here I am, staring from my balcony at the 40-year-old's married couple who took took the fight outside. For the looks of it, the wife had kicked the husband out of the house. By now, I could tell what the fight was about. Nothing too dramatic as to add spice to the story, or so I thought. Suddenly, she slapped him hard on the face, which made him turn as I gasped dramatically, which made them both look up into my balcony. Now try to see this from their perspective. They've been fighting for over 30 minutes, yelling and slamming doors, and just as they took their fight outside, they see their gay, gossip-loving neighbor with a big bag of popcorn looking from their balcony. This got them furious, as if defying the laws of physics. Their faces turned redder than they already were, and they both took their frustration at me yelling me all sorts of things. Enjoying the show, you. I honestly decided to take one for the team and kept putting popcorn into my mouth as they were yelling at me because it seemed to stop their fight and join them as a twisted, dysfunctional couple once again. They both flipped the finger at me as walked inside. Can you believe this fucking guy? The wife screamed at her husband as he patted her back and closed the door. When I got inside, I was too busy laughing to enjoy the rest of the game, but locally, my team won 5-2, so all is good in the world. I, M27, lost control on a date in front of her, F21 whole family. What can I do now? I joined website for dating to try and get more dates. That was my only intent. I have been working too much for two years at my new job. I just wanted to have more fun. I got an email and set up a date with this girl. It's my fifth date from the site. It's been fun. But this one girl was like one of those love at first sight moments when we met at a restaurant. I saw her and she was perfect. I tried to play it cool, but I felt like I could just cut ties with all the girls I've dated and just commit to her. Physically, she was everything I could ever ask for and exactly my type. Her personality seemed about a 10-10 about 30 minutes into sitting down, we didn't even order cause we were just talking. The chemistry was as good as it was with my first love when I was 13. It was perfect. Sparks were flying. I thought I was done and ready to commit here. But then she tells me to forget about ordering food. Let's go somewhere else. And she has this idea. She won't say much and I like surprises so I didn't ask much. We jumped in my car and drove to this restaurant about 20 minutes away, kind of out of town. It was halfway up a mountain near a ski resort. I'm familiar with the area, so no big deal. We walk in and her family is celebrating her aunt's birthday. There was only family, and a lot of it, about 40 people. She introduces me, and everybody was happy to meet me, and real nice. Everybody also knew that she was out on a first date. They were asking her stuff like, is this the guy? Is this your date? Is this the one? All of the sudden, I wasn't so cool and relaxed. I felt heavy pressure to be on my best behavior. It was high pressure to the third degree, but everybody was nice, so that helped. We sat down, and I started being questioned by her older sister, her aunt, and another lady that I forget her relation to my date. The mom started kind of defending me and telling them to back off and let me eat. But the interrogating continued. After I don't know how long they turned to my date and jokingly said, we approve. Then I was able to kind of get my bearings about me for a minute. I was totally off balance all night, just tense. I was afraid the back of my shirt would get that a big wet spot because I felt sweat on my back. So the sister brings her cute little girl and lets me hold her and she and my date started taking pictures of me holding her and somebody else's baby boy as well. I started to feel like the tone of it all was that we were a couple. I kind of felt like I was married to her and these nice people were my in-laws. After a couple of hours, probably closer to three hours, everybody was kind of tiring out and everything began to wind down. Keep in mind her car is still at the other restaurant down the hill. Then her dad suddenly asks me, jokingly, what my intentions are with his daughter. Though I can't remember how he phrased the question. Everybody looked at the table, looked at me, which is about half the people there. I guess I was exhausted from all the questioning. I was questioned by multiple people, multiple times, and the pressure of it all caused I kind of lost it. He asked the question. I looked across the table at her and she told her dad to 
stop it. Her dad smiles and jokingly says that he'd really like to hear my response. And her uncle, I think, also said he'd like to know, jokingly. I looked at my date and said, can I talk to you alone for a minute? To which her dad laughs loudly and says, I made him nervous. So everybody is laughing now and I guess it was a big joke. Then I said to my date, hey, can I talk to you alone for a minute? I stood up in place, kind of. It was one of those long bench seats and I couldn't push it back because other people were sitting on it. Then her sister, I think, says, oh, there are no secrets in this family. Speak your mind. People then laugh again and everybody starts making jokes about not having secrets. And this man who married into the family somehow tells me that he remembers being in my place and he says, let me give you some advice. The best thing to do right now is speak your mind and be honest. Then others join in and echo his sentiment, all jokingly, I think. So I looked at my date and she says something like, you can tell me anything here, we're all family. She also, I think, was joking. But I had started to lose my ability to tell when people were joking and when they were serious. So the dad says, wait, I haven't gotten an answer to my question. So finally, I speak directly to the dad and say, I'd like to discuss that with her first. But I regretfully laughed as I said it. So her dad says, I asked you first, I want to know. I turn to my date and she says something like, go ahead, you can tell me. I'm a big girl, I can handle it. So I said okay, and sat down, then took a couple of breaths, while her dad kind of quieted everybody down. I started with, I think I made a huge mistake. It all spiraled down from there. I said harsh things like that. I felt like I was having a bad dream, where I was suddenly married. I questioned her intentions in bringing me there. I said stuff like, what were you thinking? Yes, I liked you, but I just met you, and right now I know your aunt. I pointed at her sitting, next to me, better than I know you. I think she was humiliated, but I couldn't stop. The more I spoke, the more bad stuff came out. Total fucking tailspin. I said I want to find someone special, but I don't want to skip the first 29 dates and skip to date 30, which is what I'd done that night. Then people started interrupting and chiming in and suggesting that she and I slow down and have a real first date. I wasn't having it. I was out of control. I said, no, it's too late for that. I feel robbed here. I wanted to meet this girl, get to know her, date her, and maybe fall for her. But now it's like we're engaged and her whole family is here, and there are all these expectations. We skipped the getting to know each other and dating part, so I feel robbed. Then I said, yet another thing I regret. I said, it's a huge red flag with an emphatic gesture that I asked for minute alone with you to talk, and this is what I got instead. I added something like, you're all great and a great family, but the lack of certain boundaries is a huge red flag for me. I would never let my relationship become family business. My date interrupts me at this point and says, okay, so let's talk in private. Let's go outside and talk. I'm sorry I didn't give you that minute. Let's go outside and talk privately. I'll give you all night. She was visibly shaken, and I could tell tears were inevitable. I stood up again, and realizing that I had insulted all of them, I just quietly walked out. I felt really bad because they were all nice and had nothing but the best intentions for me. They love her, and they were literally telling me that I was good enough, which should have been a compliment, but I somehow took it the wrong way and spat in their face. I didn't even drink. Edit. We walked out, and I let her have it again. She's now sobbing uncontrollably. She apologized and pretty much begged for us to start over, and I told her I wasn't into it, and then I left her there. I drove home and couldn't help but wonder if I overreacted. I couldn't sleep, and I woke up this morning feeling like I probably did did overreact, and now I feel like shit. But it's done. I can't undo it. Let me ask this more clearly. Should I call her and apologize for humiliating her and insulting her family? Or should I just move on? Or should I wait and see if she calls and apologize then? Update. Just want to clear something up. My date never had a profile on the dating site. She was browsing through with her friend who has a profile, and they were looking for a date for her friend. It was the friend who originally messaged me to set me up with my date. Also, I deleted my profile. I'm totally done with online dating. I've been in this city two years now, so I'm gonna just go out and meet people the old-fashioned way. It just feels less risky somehow. I know this is gonna disappoint many of you, but I decided to speak with her. The very day I posted here was the day immediately after our date. That same evening, she called me, but I didn't answer because I was in the shower, so sent me a text that said, do you hate me too much to talk to me? I texted back, I don't hate you. She responded, can I call you? I texted, yes. So she called and immediately went into full apology damage control mode. I told her that it was okay, that I was already over it, and moved. On. She asked if there was any way we could meet, because there were some things she wanted to say in person, and she wanted for us to part with a handshake and all that. It kind of sounded like she needed closure, so I agreed to meet her downtown to talk the following Tuesday. Not a date, no lunch, no coffee. We just met at a park. We met, and I knew she was still the one. She told me she loves me, and we decided to try it again. We went on three dates, and I proposed. She said, yes, we're going to get married in December. No big wedding. We're going to fly to Las Vegas and do it there. The plan is to spend Christmas as a married couple. Just kidding. I'm not that fucking.
fucking crazy. Hopefully you're still reading. The rest of the update continues on the next paragraph. We met at a park just to talk. I had been so disappointed because I felt that the spark and the butterflies in the stomach would be gone, that I wouldn't like her anymore. As soon as I saw her, this was confirmed. There was no spark. She looked great, but I just didn't feel it. It kind of crushed me. So I decided to listen to her as she apologized again and told me she had really liked me on that first date and got carried away and made a very dumb decision that she wishes she could take back. She added that her mom had pulled her aside when we arrived and right from the beginning told her that if she liked me, she'd just made a big mistake by bringing me. I guess her mom pretty much cringed when she saw us walk in that night. Also, I should say that her mom was the only one defending me that night and practically pulling people off of me like her religious uncle who asked me if I'd been saved. I remember that pretty well, but I guess her mom came down on her hard for not just having a first date. But she also said that things got even crazier after I left. Her mom wasn't there for my rant. She had driven somebody home and came back after I'd left. She found my date outside crying and was told what happened. Her mom, I guess, stormed into the restaurant and went off on everybody for ganging up on me. My date says she called them a bunch of out-of-control animals. The whole thing was reduced to a big finger-pointing fest by everybody. The mom was furious because the story is that my date's dad left them when my date was nine. He had some sort of breakdown and became an alcoholic. He became verbally and emotionally abusive, so the mom kicked him out to protect the kids. He refused to get his act together and disappeared for almost ten years. So the mom hates when the dad acts like he has a say in his kids' lives since he was gone and just came back less than two years ago. But he still lives over an hour away. A lot of the people that were there, I guess, live far away and they flew in for the aunt's B-Day. Supposedly most of them she only sees once a year at the most. So the mom went off on him especially hard and questioned his right to have any say in his daughter's decision to date anybody. She embarrassed him in front of everybody for having overstepped so many boundaries. So she told me this stuff because she wanted me to know that she was very sorry she let her dad act all fatherly when it wasn't the time and it wasn't his place. These were her words, not mine. In a way, I'm glad the mom wasn't there to witness me going off cause then, I would have felt really bad. But come to think of it, she probably would have stepped in and prevented it. She asked me if there was a way we could have that first date again, but I said no. There's no way I can pretend that we are meeting for the first time after all of that. I know too much about her. I feel way too gone past that first date mode right now, and maybe I need to take a break from formal dates. I did apologize to her for not telling her right away how uncomfortable I was, and for going off on her outside the restaurant. I told her that there were a lot of nice people there that I felt bad about, but that I'm sure they understand me because they seemed reasonable. As I was talking to her, I could see how much better she felt that I had given my own apology. Her face went from subdued and sorry to kind of hopeful and semi-happy. She started to get back her glow and her spunk. We started talking about other stuff, what I do at work, my hobbies, and some other causal stuff. The more I talked, the more she glowed. I felt bad because she showed up looking kind of fragile and contrite. She looked vulnerable, but by the end of our conversation, she was smiling and looked more sure of herself. I tried to show my sense of humor and made her laugh. I felt kind of sorry for her. I made it my goal to send her home smiling. I kind of started to feel that spark again after she started smiling and laughing more. She has a great laugh. It's really cute and innocent. It felt a lot like it did at the restaurant. Her awesomeness comes back when she's comfortable. She definitely does it for me. I walked her to her car and we agreed that another date is probably not a good idea right now. She wanted to meet my yoga teacher because she's the best. My date, I feel weird not tying her name, has said she needs to learn to relax more when she's stressed out. So I met her at yoga class the following Thursday, the 7th, and made the introduction. My date has been coming to the same three yoga sessions that I do weekly. We talk there. She still flirts with me and hints that we should meet for hot tea. Neither of us is a coffee drinker. I walk her to her car after class, because it's dark by then. I still like her, and I can tell she feels the same way. The spark is all the way back now. But all those comments I got here on my original post about her being crazy are still completely lodged in my head. They have me second-guessing myself about staying in touch with her. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but whatever it is, it's gonna take time. Today, I fucked up by looking at my fiancé's location history and found out that she has been cheating on me. Obligatory. This happened two days ago. I had been together with my girlfriend for almost four years. I proposed to her about a month ago. She said yes, and we were incredibly happy, or so I thought. About three weeks after our proposal, I noticed she starts acting different, not having sex with me, looking away, down when we kiss. She had also been spending way too much time, at least four days of MF each week, with her co-workers drinking beer after work, driving home drunk, and often pretty late. I went 
to a few of these gatherings, but didn't really enjoy getting slammed on a Monday night when I have work the next day, so I often opted out. We would also share our Google location with each other at all times, mostly because she traveled to sketchy places for work, and I would regularly go on trails, so it helped each of us know the other was safe. I looked at her location one day, and it was turned off. I texted her about it, and she said that she kept receiving notifications about it, so she had turned it off. Hadn't been a problem for the past year. She turned it back on, and it was off again the next day. She also had two phones, a personal and a work phone, which she would keep both with her at all times. I only had the location for the personal phone. Eventually, she stopped using her personal phone and only used the work phone. Two days ago, about a month after the proposal, I decided to snoop because my suspicion was at its highest, and I just wanted to put it to rest. I used her computer to log into her Gmail account and looked at her timeline. She had been going to an address across town about ten times in the past two weeks. I called her immediately because she said she was at the office finishing up some work that was due the next day. She said she was at work, but leaving to go to the grocery store, which she then did. I waited until she got home and confronted her about it. She said she had been meeting a guy from work just to talk and hang out, but she didn't want to tell me because she thought I would get mad. Turns out, she met him for the first time about two days after the proposal and started seeing him at his house within that week. I kept prying, asking her more questions. She told me they had only kissed twice. Then it turned into they had made out, and she denied every accusation of sleeping with him every time I asked. The next day, when I got home from work, I asked to see her phone to read the messages between the two of them. She said she deleted them, so I said I wanted to look at it anyways, just to be sure. I started recovering the data from the last backup. She sat down beside me while I was doing it and asked what I was doing. I told her, and the look of panic in her face was real. So she starts talking about feelings and all this other crap while the phone is recovering. I asked her one last time, before I look at this, is there anything you want to tell me? She was silent. I asked flat out, did you sleep with him? And she said yes. Turns out that she met with him almost every day, starting about eight days after the proposal and had sex with him most of those. Funny enough, the data recovery didn't even work, so that's a win, I guess. Planning on moving my stuff out later this week to a new place. Haven't told her yet. Still can't believe she started cheating on me less than two weeks after she said yes to my proposal. And even more so with someone she met a few days after the proposal. Feels shitty, but I'm keeping my head up. How do I tell my mom I slept with her boyfriend before they met? I, 23F, have been encouraging my mom, 40F, to date for a while. She's been a single mom most of my life, and it seemed her only priority was her children. My mom deserves love just like any other person. She's put us first for so long that it was time to put herself first for once. Well, she met a guy after some encouragement from me, and I was happy for her. But recently, she introduced me to her new boyfriend, 49 me. I instantly recognized the guy because we slept together a few times last year. I kept my cool in front of everyone, but internally, I was freaking the fuck out. I know he knows as well, since he came up to me when we had a second alone and asked me not to tell my mom. I don't think I can do that. I want to tell her, but I don't want to hurt my mom. I really don't want her and him getting super serious or worse, him becoming future stepdad or something. How do I tell her without breaking her heart or her hating me? Edit. Thanks for the advice to the people who gave it. I'm currently writing a letter that I'm planning on giving to my mom. I think that's a good solution. That way I can say what I want to say without stumbling or saying the wrong thing in the moment. As for people judging what two consenting adults do and infantilizing women fuck off and the people who are just commenting about porn and other vile shit should fuck off to. This sub is supposed to be a place to get and give advice, not a debate club about morals. Update. When I made my post and got some advice, I decided to write a letter so I could get my thoughts and feelings out properly. I won't put it here because it is very person and emotional. Anyway, I gave my mom the letter, then night. I stayed in the room with her as she read it. I had tears welling up as she was reading, thinking she would hate me after it. After she read it, I started crying, and she started crying. It was all very emotional, but my mom assured me that she would never hate me, and she was glad I wrote the letter, and I think we just hugged for a solid few minutes, just crying into each other. We calmed down a bit after that and just spent the rest of the night watching movies and eating junk food. The morning after that, my mom ending things with her BF. There was a bit of drama there with him calling me a SLIT and my mom screaming at him for calling me that, but after that we haven't heard from him since and have been drama free. Me and my mom seem a lot closer now, and I feel like I can be more honest with her without fear of judgment or losing her love, thanks to the people who actually gave advice and didn't make disgusting comments. Your advice was very helpful and got me to pull my head out of my ass and tell her ASAP. My husband has a second family. The ultimate cliche has happened in my life, and I'm absolutely broken. My husband, my rock, has been having an affair for over 17 years. We have been married for over 25 years. We have three beautiful children, two in college and one who still lives at home. But turns out, he's had another set this whole time. My husband is an insurance broker. He has multiple branches over the country which he spends week on, week off. Turns out on his week off, 
He's been with his other family in Albuquerque, where his other branch is. He's got a fiancé, whom he has two kids with, both in their early teens. I found out when I went to make a new Facebook account, and when I searched my husband's first name, another profile, with another last name popped up, and through that profile were the links to his fiancé's and his other kids' Facebooks. My husband is currently with said family, and I know it's him because his most recent post is a photo of him and that other family eating dinner. Among those photos were photos of him kissing the girl and him being fatherly with kids who look nearly identical to my husband. I am absolutely broken. Almost every part of me wants to scream in his face and reprimand him for ruining my life. But another part of me wants to pretend to be ignorant and let it be. Because our life is peaceful. He's good with our kids. He's the main source of financial income. He's loving, but he's also all those things to another family. Not only would I be tearing a gaping hole into my family, I'd be opening up a vortex for them too. My heart is in shambles. I've never cried so much in my life. My youngest son is currently on a graduation trip with friends, and I'm alone till my lying, cheating, bastard husband comes home. My life is absolutely wrecked. It's literally a movie plot. I'm hoping he'll just come home, and it'll be a big misunderstanding why he's kissing a woman with a ring on her finger. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm tempted to pack a bag and just leave. I can't be in the home where we've raised our kids, where we've spent every Christmas for the last 26 years, and where I've been alone on New Year's taking care of our babies, while he works his ass off. I just can't. I want to leave a note for him to come home to, hurt him like he's hurt me, but I don't think that's possible. I don't know how I'll ever face him again. Update. This is a follow-up. Firstly, thank you so much for the advice. I'm not in any means good with legal things, so all legal advice has been noted. I've rung an attorney. We are discussing the process. He's also told me to gather as much evidence as I could, such as photos of the Facebook pages, text messages, and resent flight information. All has been put into a folder, and I'll present it to a judge or jury when we go into some sort of divorce proceeding. Again, not fully clear with specifics, but it's a good sign. I've also been in contact with the other woman. I've told her, explained the situation, and she was equally as distraught. From what I'm aware, she's financially independent from him, and they don't share property, so it seems very clean-cut on her behalf. My husband is aware of the fact I know, and is currently staying in a hotel, but he is unaware the other woman knows. I confronted him when he walked through the door. He started to cry and plead, and it was honestly kind of pathetic. I mean, I was crying too, but I've chosen to think of him as a pathetic coward for doing this, because he is. But anyways, I have my name on the property. We both do, so it's not like I can just kick him out, but he's chosen to stay away for my sake. All I am thinking is, if he chose to stay away for my sake, maybe being faithful for my sake should have been considered too. Despite this, he's staying away. He's in a hotel downtown where he calls every few hours to check up. I'm no longer sad. Well, I am. But I'm way more furious than sad currently. My kids still have no idea, and my youngest thinks my husband is just working more in Albuquerque because of a business problem. I'm still confused at how to tell them they have two half-siblings and two parents, one with an extra backup parent. I'm just feeling very, very unappreciated and unwanted lately, but your kind words have been so helpful. Thank you guys so much. Much love. Update. This is in reference to my post titled, My Husband Has a Second Family. Firstly, I would like to start off by thanking everyone who had positive things to say. The widespread support has been so helpful during this period, and I am truly amazed at the kindness shown to me. Thank you. And now the update. I won't be going into details about the divorce because it is still ongoing, but do rest assured it is happening. A few people seemed worried I was going to stay with him, and for a period of time I would have. But no, we are divorcing. On that note, I have completely cut contact with him. Our contact is through lawyers only. He officially moved out of the house, and my middle moved back in to help out over the break. My kids have, to my knowledge, cut most contact with him, but I haven't asked as it is not my place. Also, custody isn't a problem because my youngest turned 18 recently. We have also been in contact with the other family, and we even spent Christmas together. Despite being a little awkward at first, me and his ex fiance are trying our hardest to bring the kids together harmoniously. And that'll be the last update. I'm logging off of Reddit now. I will continue living my life. I'll try to support my kids through theirs, but I'll forever be thankful for the support and love you all have shown. My dad abandoned me when I was two and now wants to meet me. I ended up living in a six foster homes and faced a lot of abuse after my mom OD'd. Does it make me a horrible person to meet him just to tell him how I grew up? My mom overdosed when I was four. I was used to her passing out for periods of time, so I just made toast and watched cartoons at first. But on the third day, I got bored and went to play at the playground. Someone became concerned, and next thing you know, they're taking her away, and I'm going to stay with some nice people. Well, none of this people were very nice. I could go in details, but let's just say that I was removed from the first few due to abuse. And by the time I was put in a decent home, I wasn't a nice little kid people wanted to adopt anymore. I was too old and an asshole who hated them because I knew, in little kid logic, that even though they had red bunk beds and gave me ice cream after dinner, that soon, they would be like the rest. I eventually ran away when I was 16.
16, my foster dad got mad at me for going in the fridge without asking, and next thing I know, I'm packing my bags because I figured someone would pay me to do shitty work and wouldn't treat me like trash. I'm 24 now, and my dad friended me on FB. We have the same name, and he sent me a long message about how he's gotten older now and thinks I should meet my siblings, etc. I hate him. Maybe I shouldn't. But he left me with a heroin addict and went on about his life. He has a family now? Well, cool. I never had one. Not until I grew up and started my own. I honestly think that letting him know I don't want to be his buddy or his son or whatever he thinks he needs would make me feel better. I could stop hating him and resenting him, unload it on him, and just move on. I also want to let him now that I lived in an apartment with my dead mom for three days and we didn't have anyone who cared about us enough to come by. I want to show him the burns I have on my arm. I want to let him know that I hid from one of my foster dads every night under my bed and prayed to a God I no longer believe in that he would just leave me alone. I want him to know that I never had real birthdays or Christmases, that I wasn't allowed to go in the fridge in most of these places, and in extreme cases, I wasn't even allowed to leave my room unsupervised. Would this be petty and horrible? Should I just ignore him? Update. I wrote a message. Is this okay to send? I decided I don't want to come off as bitter or angry, but I don't want him to still have hope of some kind of Hallmark movie ending either. Dear Jack, I am 24 years old. I am not the little boy who cried when you left. I am a man with a son and daughter of my own. I've never spent more than a weekend away from them. I am a father and a damned good one. I don't need you anymore. Once, I needed you. When my mom died, I really could have used a dad. I could have used anybody. When she died, there wasn't even anybody there. No one cared about us. I spent three days in that apartment, eating toast and just waiting for her to wake up. And then they called you because you were my dad. You were 23. Young, but not so young, really. If you had came and gotten me, you would have had a son. I would have loved you forever, but you didn't. So I went to a bunch of people who didn't love me, but liked the check they got with me. It didn't make them treat me well. I have burn marks on my arm and I still can't spend time in closed in dark spaces after being shut in closets. An afternoon is a long time when you can't count. I didn't count on anybody. I used to pray, the way mom did with me when I was little. But after praying for someone to come and rescue me, long enough, hiding under my bed and praying that my foster dad wouldn't come in and would leave me alone for just one night. Just one night. I stopped believing in most things. I lived in seven different homes from 416, and even the decent ones, I was never family. I didn't have real birthdays or Christmases. I wasn't allowed to go in the fridge and just get food when I was hungry. When I was 16, me and my foster dad got in a fight over a ham sandwich. Boy, what are you doing in our things? And so, I left. 16, with nobody to call, and 40 bucks. I just walked away with a backpack. Anything could have happened to me, but I made it. I'm a man now, and I don't need you. I don't want you to feel bad. I just want you to know why I can't be your son. I'm 24 and have never been anyone's son. I don't know how, and I just don't have it in me. Jackson Edit. He also wrote a comment on a post about kids who overcame. October 12th, 2012. Well, I am not some celebrity success story, but considering my poor placements and the fact that I ran away from the foster system in high school when I was 16, I think I might roughly qualify for ending up a pretty average guy. I'm 24 and work as an electrician. I have an associates in it. Who would have guessed I'd go to college? No one. I went to school when I was 19 after I got my GED. I'm married with two kids. The oldest is three and the youngest is seven months. And I'm a really good dad, which surprised me because I never had one, but I adore my kids. I would walk on fire for them. I'm happy. And I think that blue collar middle class living suits me. I honestly thought I'd end up in prison or something, but instead I found this life. What would happen if I walked into a random McDonald's and started working? So I quit working at McDonald's like a week ago and I still have my work uniform. I was wondering what would happen if I just walked into a different McDonald's than the one I worked at and just started working. Would I get into trouble with the law or would they just tell me to leave if they noticed? Quick background info. I quit my job at McDonald's and still have my uniform. I decided to go to a random McDonald's and just start working to see what happens. So I went to a McDonald's in a nearby town around 4 p.m. yesterday. I parked at a nearby store where I had a good view of the drive through I waited until the drive through was very full to go to the McDonald's since they would be too busy to pay attention to me. I casually walked in and pretended to clock in. I washed my hands and put on my gloves. There were only three workers in the grill area. Two of them were busy online and the other was frantically dropping 10 ones. When they saw me, they told me to drop nuggets. I dropped nuggets and restocked the little freezer that was by the fryer and continued working. One of them asked me if I was new. I just told him it's my third day and he didn't question it. After a while, once things calmed down, one of the workers started teaching me how to do line. I just pretended like I had no clue what I was doing even though I did. I just occasionally made simple mistakes like putting diced onions on quarter pounders. Things went downhill once the manager started asking us what breaks we've taken and which we haven't. I stayed quiet, hoping he wouldn't ask me directly. The manager looked at me and said, and you? I told him I haven't had any of my breaks. He asked if I was new. I said, yeah, and gave him a fake name, Bradley Johnson. He looked through his list and told me he couldn't find my name on the schedule. I said, huh, that's
that's weird. I'm scheduled to work today from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. He then left to check the system. So I continued working. Once he got back, he said, who are you? We don't have you in our system. I told him that there must be a mistake since I already had my orientation on Wednesday and I also worked Thursday. He left to double check and once he returned, he told me that I wasn't in the system or the schedules. I told him I had no idea what's going on and that I'm as confused as he is. He was already kind of pissed at this point and he called the hiring manager. As you could already guess, he found out I wasn't an employee and he told me to get the fuck out or he was going to call the police. I left and the crew members were just talking with each other about UTF just happened. Today, I fucked up by hiding in my girlfriend's room when her strict Asian parents suddenly came home long time Reddit reader, first time making an account because I am currently stuck in my girlfriend's room while she and her family are having dinner downstairs. I haven't eaten since morning nor showered and I need to take a shit. Backstory to this morning, since the lockdown for COVID-19 happened, I haven't seen my girlfriend for over a month plus. Our government recently relaxed the quarantine so we are allowed to go out but not loiter. Woke up to my girlfriend's call around 11 a.m. saying that her parents went out to get something. I thought okay, I'll come over, return her a camera I borrowed, and maybe we can sit in my car around her neighborhood and hang out a while. It was a little rushed as her parents just left her house as I left mine. I'm about 20 minutes away from her place. She assured me her parents will be out for at least one and a half hours as they need to get lunch. I drove as fast as I could and picked her up from the front of the house and we drove to park nearby to hang out. After a couple of minutes, I asked if she brought some water as I asked her about it before I came and she said no. She said why don't you come in and take some water since her parents will still be far away. I said yes, obviously, and went in, drank water, and we sat on the couch for a while to cuddle. I was a little paranoid, but I haven't seen her in a long time so I needed it. About ten men, we hear a car outside her house, and that's how Tifu, it was her parents. They were only out for 40 minutes or FML we panicked. Luckily, I parked away from her house and took my slippers in. I contemplated just owning up and lying that I needed to use the toilet, but her mom is really difficult. She would assume my girlfriend was lying and get her trouble, and I haven't even met her parents officially as her boyfriend yet. If you are from an Asian family or have heard of Asian parents being strict about relationships, it's true. We both ran up to her room and I hid behind her door. Mind you, her room is really small. It's about the size of two single beds. Can't hide under the bed as she has to keep her door open and you can see straight under her bed from the stairs. The only place possible is behind her door. I stood there frozen av as she went down to greet her parents. I could hear them coming in as I hugged the wall as tightly as I could. She came back up freaking out but I said it's okay, let's just try formulate a plan. She said okay and she went down to eat with them first, which I had then had to stay as silent as possible with. No fan or air conditioning so I sweated my ass off. 1 p.m. ish. She comes back up and we try to listen whether her parents are coming up or not. They usually sit downstairs after lunch and nap, which they did. Gave me a little bit of relief as I could sit down in the floor. The space in between the door and her table is super tiny which is uncomfortable but I'm not complaining. 2 p.m. Her dad comes up to shower and her door is right next to the bath area. Fuck I can hear the water rushing. But good news my girlfriend is in the room doing her work so she can look out. It's weird. As I'm just standing up behind the door and looking at her, look back at me. After his shower, her dad leaves to go to his store, which leaves her mom downstairs. She gets on a long phone call, which gives me a bit of room to relax. My girlfriend and I make out a bit to calm our nerves, and I gotta say, it did help. For the next three hours, her mom stays downstairs, and we try to formulate a plan, but everything involves the timing of her parents, which is impossible. Can't jump out the window because it's grilled, and she doesn't have the key. Around 5.30 p.m.-ish, her dad comes home and almost fucking comes into her room. He asks her to print something, and she quickly walks to her door to stop him from coming in. I hear his voice right outside the door. Thankfully, he walks away and goes down to watch TV. And I swear to God, the universe wants us to suffer because right after that, her mom comes upstairs and hangs about the common area. My girls had recorded a Zoom meeting, so she tells her mom she has a meeting and plays it, and closing the door, giving my legs much needed rest, and I sit. 7 p.m. Her mom calls her from downstairs that it's time to eat. And that's where we are at now. It's currently 9 p.m. at this sentence, and I can hear her family talking to each other. She has to turn off the lights and fan and air conditioning, so I'm freaking drenched in my sweat in the dark. I'm sitting down, but I've got pins and needles in my feet now. I would stand up, but because the area is so tight, I don't want to risk any noise. Oh, remember how I haven't eaten and need to shit? That's attacking now. My stomach is growling and I'm making fart noises. I'm so scared to be caught because my parents are going to slaughter me too. My girlfriend and I will discuss our plans for me to escape when she comes up. How can I manage the resentment my girlfriend, 25F, and I, 42M, have for each other? I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for the absurd age gap and the way we started. And I agree and I deserve it, but I would really like some genuine advice past going to counseling. She won't agree and I can't afford it anyways. Tangible things that I can work on and introduce to help us get past this, either as a couple or as effective co-parents. Long story short, my ex-wife and I were together since middle school. We have four daughters 
in their teens. I was a SAHD and part-time worker for most of my life until my youngest was in middle school. My ex agreed to invest in a passion project business of mine. I hired a receptionist. We started an affair and she baby trapped me. Now we're living together and have a young son. She resents me because she feels she was fooled. She saw me as a business owner who had a nice car, nice clothes, took her to, nice places, etc. She thought I was rich, so she got pregnant on purpose. Admitted it, not an assumption. Hoping to use me to not work and sponsor her family from overseas. Well, actually, my ex-wife and her family are the rich ones. None of our homes were in our names. We were renting from her parents and giving them a nominal fee with the expectation that these homes would be left to my ex and me after their death. This allowed my ex's salary, 150k, not huge in the high COL area, to stretch, and we lived a really good life. I left our marriage with half our savings, 25k, and my personal property and car. I lost my business due to lack of funding, and I did not seek alimony. I resent her because I feel I was fooled. I thought she loved me and couldn't believe the interest a young hot woman showed in me. She was incredibly persistent and pursued me strongly, but she has no feelings for me, no care or desire. Now that the ruse is dropped, I can't believe I gave up my entire life for what I see was an ego trip. I loved my ex-wife, really I did, and still do, but I had never been with another woman, and any attempts to open our relationship were shot down. This was like a wet dream come true, and I was weak. Now both me and my GF are in a place we didn't imagine. She's living in a shitty apartment with an old man and still has to work. I've lost my kids, the love of my life, my family, my lifestyle, my business, and it's all 100% my own fault. She stopped being intimate with me as soon as she found out I wasn't rich. We're still together on my end because I feel like I need to have something to show for this shit show of a situation. At least I got a son and a partner out of it. At least it wasn't for nothing. And also because I don't trust her with our son. She would never agree to give me full custody and she's not a good mother. I would be worried for his safety and the people she would have him around. I honestly don't know why she hasn't left me from her end. What can I do to improve this situation? I know logically it would be best to break up and co-parent, but I'm afraid for my son and I'm embarrassed for myself. Is there a way to salvage this situation? I'm thinking of just telling her we can have an open relationship. She can sleep with whoever she wants and go wherever she wants as long as she lives here so I can have my son 100% of the time. I work from home. I don't know if that's the answer here though. Update. I had an affair. My ex-wife divorced me and my kids absolutely refused to speak to me. I was an incredibly involved dad. Most of their lives I worked one to two days a week and then stayed home with them the rest. I was closer to them than their mom and I'd like to think I've never disappointed them before this. I made a mistake. It's been over two years since it all came out and I haven't been able to make any headway. My eldest is hung up on the fact that I now have a young son. Every firstborn of each generation in my family has been a boy for a long time and she broke the streak. I honestly could not care less about that. I've always thought that pressure was stupid and I'm not a traditionally masculine guy that always wanted a boy. But she's so hurt that I have a son and is convinced that's all I've ever wanted and he's replaced her and my daughters. None of that is true. All of my girls said they don't consider themselves to have a brother and want nothing to do with him. All four of them feel betrayed and blame me for breaking up our family. I deserve the blame. It's my fault and I take responsibility. But I can't change the past and I don't know how I can begin making up for it. My ex has full custody of them, but I'm supposed to have visitation one weekend a month. They're all in therapy and it was suggested to not enforce the visitation and respect their boundaries while they work through it. I've done that the entire time and there's no progress made. Does anyone have any suggestions about what I can do here? My ex absolutely hates me, but was always supportive of the girls staying in contact with me. She's respected their wishes, but still gives me updates once in a while. My eldest is turning 18 soon and graduating this coming year and probably moving away for university. I feel like the time to make up with her especially is slipping away. I know I'm the shitty person here. I was a terrible husband, but I was honestly a really good dad and I miss my girls. Has anyone been through something like this? How did it turn out? What are your suggestions? Update. Good news. My girlfriend and I have broken up. She has gone back to her home country and left my son with me. Refused to sign any formal custody agreement, so I'm hoping she stays there and doesn't bother us again. I'm pretty sure if she comes back and demands time with him, I have a good case for maintaining custody. She's not even interested in FaceTiming with him, so he remembers her. I feel bad that my son will deal with a shitty, absent mother, but I hope I can get him into therapy as he grows. Bad news. I've tried my best to insist on visitation with my daughters, and that has fallen through. They absolutely refuse to see me. They wrote me a letter together that says how much they hate me, how betrayed they feel, how they'll never forgive me, and how my son will never be their brother. To not even bother telling him about them, because they'll never be interested in knowing him. Just to forget about them all 
altogether and move on with my new family. I have no legal recourse. The youngest is 13 now, old enough to have a say in custody arrangements, and I don't think forcing them to see me would do me any favors long term anyways. They also included pictures of their mother's wedding. My ex has no obligation to tell me about her personal life, but I'm pretty pissed that there is a man living with my daughters that I didn't know about. It is a family friend that has been in their lives 10 plus years, so not a total stranger but still hurt to see pictures of their recent wedding and family pictures with my daughters. They mentioned that they have a father figure and don't need me anyways. The whole thing really hurt. I know I have no right to feel hurt that my ex has moved on when I cheated on her, but their whole relationship has moved very fast, so I'm now wondering if they started it before we got divorced. No way to know now. Doesn't matter anyways. My ex agreed to keep me up to date and send pictures of my daughters once in a while. After dealing with my son's mom, I'm grateful she is so good to our girls and I don't have to worry about their well-being. I'm trying to focus on being a good dad to my son and patiently waiting for my girls to grow up and reach out. It may never happen, but I'm hopeful that they will understand me more as they become adults and gain context for life. Today I fucked up by giving my 17-year-old nephew advice on how to meet women. A few weeks ago I flew out to Fresno to visit my younger sister and her family since I hadn't seen them in four years. The first night in town was wonderful and wholesome. They gave me a quick tour of the local sites, and we ended up at a local restaurant for a family dinner. The conversation mostly revolved around family matters and how the boys were doing in school. The older son, Alec, was enjoying his senior year at HS and had a healthy social life, dating often. On the other hand, my nephew Dan does very well academically, but has zero game with the ladies. When I pressed him as to why, he admitted he had a hard time approaching them and mostly stuttered and blushed. Alec chimed in with the observation that his brother seemed to fancy more robust girls, which sent the table laughing, except for my sister and Dan. Being the laid-back uncle, I let the matter drop until my sister excused herself to use the ladies' room. As she walked away, I leaned over and offered a bit of advice from my Marine Corps days. If he liked bigger women, then he needed to go to a place where size isn't judged, but don't go empty-handed. I suggested finding a clothing store that accommodates plus sizes and bring along some snacks as an icebreaker. Now that I think of it, I was about four cocktails into the evening, and the snickering coming from my brother-in-law and nephew should have been a warning of sorts. So the topic dropped after Sis returned, and that was pretty much my first evening. A few days later, it occurred to all of us Dan was leaving the house early in the day and was returning much later at night in uncommonly good moods. When his mother inquired, he explained about gaming with friends and so on. However, I wasn't buying it. I pulled him aside and got the truth. The boy explained that after some trial and error, he found a strip mall in town that had both a chicken shack and a reputable plus-sized women's clothing store. He would buy a bucket of chicken tenders and eat on the the hood of his car, chatting up women as they walked by. He met a girl, and they had been seeing each other. I was happy I could help, and couldn't believe it actually worked. However, things took a turn for the worse. A few days after my return to the East Coast, I received a very emotional call from my sister. She explained between curses lobbed at me she had gone clothing shopping one day, and when she went to enter the store, there was a, have you seen this man flyer on the door? It was a grainy surveillance photo of Dan sitting on the hood of his car with a bucket of chicken and a two-liter bottle of soda. The flyer warned of a man youth approaching women as they tried to shop, and though he had been warned off, he still may be a threat. When she confronted the boy, he rolled on me, and his father played ignorant. Now Dan is grounded until the threat of restraining orders dies down, and I was informed that I am not invited for Christmas. Poor Dan can't go out to see his new girlfriend and blames me for that as well. I'm considering divorcing my wife because she can't get over her mom dying. Yes, I am aware that everyone is outraged by the headline and prepared to call me a bastard. I beg such individuals to read the entire post before passing judgment. The mother of my 36M wife's 33F mother passed away from lung cancer five years ago. It was hardly an easy or tranquil death. After the diagnosis, our lives naturally came to a halt, and we both took extended leaves of absence from work to assist in taking care of her mother. At the time, my wife's grieving process was very conventional, going through several phases. Our three children are the same. Nevertheless, my wife deteriorated greatly after her death. I am fully aware of this. Since I haven't lost a parent, I can't claim to fully comprehend her experiences, but I can appreciate her grief. After that, she hardly could function for months. Almost all of the home and child-rearing duties were kindly assumed by me. Since receiving the diagnosis, 
and even after her death, she had been going to bereavement therapy. This is not the issue at all. I did my best to offer as much support as I could. For months, she wept on my shoulder every night, and I simply assumed that this was the worse version of for better or worse. The issue is that she does not appear to have gotten any better or more functional after five years. She said nothing could assist her and that grief therapy would not help her, so she quit going around four years ago and refused to go back. She will have a significant dip approximately one month prior to any significant holiday. Crying all day, spending half of the day in bed, lacking the energy to do anything around the house, and not wanting to engage with the family. This will continue for approximately a week following the conclusion of the holiday. Every holiday brings me great sorrow, no more so than it did five years ago. Every year, October, November, December, and January, her mother's birthday month, are very difficult for me because I am basically raising my three children alone without my wife. She has been totally disabled by grief for the past five years, or around six months of the year. I really do mean it when I say incapacitated. She can't have any intimacy with me or the kids when she's in the depths of her grief. There isn't any snuggling hanging out with us, or taking family vacations. Half the year I'm not having sex. She can't even get words out if she tries to talk about it, so I've stopped asking if she wants to talk about it. The fact that the youngsters are no longer inquiring or showing care is what hurts the most. When they arrive home and see their mother in bed, they simply carry on with their days, saying in passing that, oh, mom is sad today. In response to inquiries from me or their siblings about her whereabouts, they hardly ever get more than tears from mom, so they don't really look for affection from her anymore. I've talked talked about this with therapists, my parents, friends, and so on. I'm aware of all the arguments people will make against it, so let me to address them now. She refuses to visit a doctor for depression or return to therapy for grief counseling. Yes, I am aware of her extreme depression. She cannot be made to visit the doctor by me. I've made a lot of attempts. Yes, the intensity hasn't changed in the last five years. No, I never blow her off or tell her to get over it. Most days I attempt to give her some comfort, but on my worst days, I just give her space and leave her alone. You can judge me for leaving her alone if you want to, but know that right now, I feel like I'm just exhausted from being a caregiver. She has ADHD, but she does not have a history of depression. I'm not sure if that matters. It feels like my wife passed away with her mother. She doesn't seem to be able or wanting to go on after her mother's death, but I would do anything to get her back, even just a tiny bit of her. I know it's terrible to think of getting a divorce, but I'm at a loss on what to do. Update. You can find the post I made a few days ago by visiting my profile. During my work break, I wrote the post as a sort of stream of consciousness. Since nothing I've ever posted has ever received any significant attention, I just believed it would be forgotten and didn't go back to look at it till later. And to be very honest, I was afraid that I would receive a ton of flack for being callous or insensitive in the comments. I was a little overwhelmed with the thought of replying to all of the incredibly nice and insightful direct messages I received, so I thought I would publish an update here. Somebody suggested that I should have her hospitalized against her will. Although I didn't include it in the initial post, I did question our family doctor about it maybe a year ago, and he said it's unlikely to happen unless she poses a threat to herself or others. I did some research on this as well, and it seems to apply to the state in which we currently reside. I acknowledge that she requires requires medical attention. I have a suspicion that she lied to her counselor throughout the year she spent receiving grief counseling following the loss of her mother. She told me, upon returning from one of her final sessions, that her counselor had probably told her she wouldn't need to go much longer. She then went and sobbed on the bed. She still doesn't want to return to counseling, despite my best efforts. I'm pleased I commented on Reddit, though, because I hadn't really given it much thought that she would require more than counseling and more extensive treatment. Another comment that really frightened me was one suggesting that if I offer her a divorce ultimately made him, she would take extreme measures. Considering those points, I don't believe that's the best course of action. Rather, I want to write her a letter outlining our need for her return, our profound love and concern for her, and the fact that she requires more assistance than either of us can offer on her own. I will also advise her to see a doctor and be open about her experiences. I appreciate all of your advice. Update. I didn't want to post again, but I decided to do so after receiving many encouraging responses. My soon-to-be ex-wife has gone up utterly insane. I wrote the letter to her over the course of a few days after my last post. I wrote that to let them know how much the kids and I care about her and how much we adore her. I told her about all the concerning behavior and that I thought she should see a doctor more often. Thank you to everyone who brought this to my attention. I explained that it sounded like she was experiencing complex sorrow and that the grief counseling she had years prior had not been enough to help her work through it. I did not mention that we might have a divorce, but I did explain that the kids couldn't stay in their current circumstances. I don't really feel 
feel like transcribing the whole letter here. The night I finished drafting the letter, after the kids had gone to bed, I read it to her. She gave me the old thousand-yard stare after I finished reading for approximately 15 minutes before getting up and moving toward the door. I asked her where she was going. Could we talk about this? I'm worried about your safety. And in a frenzy, I tried to stop her. I hope when your parents die, someone doesn't tell you to get over it, she remarked, rolling her eyes at me and speaking in the coldest voice I've ever heard her use. After that, I just let her leave without attempting to stop her. It took me maybe five minutes to get very angry before the panic returned. I had a real fear that she would take her own life. I looked at my phone and saw that she had disabled her location. Over the course of the following hour, I must have called and texted her 50 times, pleading with her to at least confirm that she was okay and wouldn't be taking any severe action. She called me from her phone just as I was about to contact the cops. As soon as I replied, a man's voice informed me that she fine but she doesn't want to talk to you and hung up before I could say anything more. At the moment, I thought I was experiencing an out-of-body experience. I was clueless as to what the fuck was happening. Despite my disassociation, I nearly contacted the police. However, I talked myself out of it. All night I called her phone, but nobody answered. It started going straight to voicemail at around 2 in the morning. That night, I slept very little. She wasn't home when I woke up the following morning. Thank God, the kids didn't question where mom was when I took them to daycare or school. This is something I always do, and my wife is usually still asleep. All morning I kept trying to reach my wife's phone, but all I got was voicemail. When I inquired if she was at work over the phone, her office informed me that she had phoned in ill. Being a nervous wreck, I essentially just sat on my couch and tried to get a hold of her after calling in ill to work too. I also gave my mother a call, asking her if she could come get the kids from school today and stay with them overnight. I told her about something urgent that had come up and that I needed some help, but I didn't tell her everything that was going on. Sometime about 4 p.m., my wife entered the room. When I attempted to give her an embrace, she recoiled. When I asked her where she had been, she just stared blankly at me. I asked her, using her phone, who had called me, but she just stared at me blankly. I I ordered her to get the fuck out at this point because I was becoming upset and she didn't want to explain what was going on. I now feel bad for speaking it that way, but holy crap, was I irritated. She then began to speak, but her voice made it sound like I was speaking to a text-to-speech AI. Lack of feeling, completely flat, almost irritated. She informed me that she had visited the home of her buddy John, fictitious name. I begged her to go into more detail since I had no idea who the heck John was. I managed to extract much of the narrative from her over the course of about two two hours of conversation. She was responding to my questions like a lawyer would, providing me with very generic responses devoid of any background information. John is essentially a co-worker. The guy and I had crossed paths a few times at office party gatherings, but we have never really spoken. He never seemed to be interested in my wife or to hang out with her. However, it appears that throughout the past year or so, she has confided in him about her anguish over her mother's passing, and he has been consoling her. She must have felt a connection with him that she did not have with me, because he also lost a father to cancer. She tells me that after I read her the letter, she came to John's house to chat and get consolation since she felt that I don't care about her or her mom's death. She answered me no when I directly inquired if she was having an affair with him. She told me it was none of my concern when I questioned her about why she had never disclosed that she was good friends with this unidentified man. She claims that they cuddled and that he held her while she cried when I questioned whether anything transpired between them while she was there. She denied when I asked to see her phone so I could read their texts. She was unable to provide me with much further information regarding the circumstances. I thus attempted to check her phone while she went to take a shower. Her passcode had been altered. I took hold of her iPad and verified there, as my thumbprint biometric signature was still present. While she was taking a shower, I took the iPad and went outside to search for proof. I looked for communications to or from a John right away, but it took a little while to find it. It was clearly him, even though she had added him to her contacts as Stacy. There were texts from more than a year ago. He consoled her a lot while she talked a lot about her mother. He frequently tells her things like, I don't really care about her, and if they were married, he would never treat her that way. Her responses were all in agreement. She's been moaning about me in a lot of texts. He trash-talked me a lot. She had texted him the night before, saying, fuck it, I'm on my way over if the offer is still there, to which he instantly replied, yes. She texted him the following morning, adding, if he asks, we just talked. I spent 20 minutes throwing up out the door of my car in a Walmart parking lot. When I got home, she was on the couch using her phone, as if she didn't even realize I was gone. I informed 
told her that she had to go because I knew. Once more, she just continued to gaze at me without saying anything, till I lost my cool and told her to get the fuck out of the home. She informed me, John was right about you, as soon as she stood up and walked out. Since then, I haven't seen her. I informed the children that she had visited her parents. I have to tell them something soon, but I'm not sure what to say. To be honest, I have no idea what to do. I should divorce her ostensibly, but it's overwhelming to consider child support, custody, and other issues. I haven't moved yet and feel immobilized. Even though I know she's gone insane and that this is most likely a psychotic break, I can't stand it any longer. I put on a strong, numb facade to go to work, and then at night, for my kids, and after they go to bed, I cry till I pass out. It seems like my life is coming to an end. Though I think John took advantage of her weakness, I don't even want to waste my time attempting to convince her that he is a predator. She made this decision rather than sticking with her fucking family. I doubt I'll be checking into this account or making any additional updates. My marriage is falling apart because of my changed lifestyle. I am a 37-year-old woman. I have been married to my husband, 40M, for a decade. We have two children together, 7M and 4F. I never experienced issues in my marriage before. After my son was born, I fell into a deep depression. My life was off track anyway. I was stuck in a dead-end, low-paying job. I was taking care of my boy alone because my husband had to work overtime to support us. When my daughter arrived, I decided to change my life. I used to drink heavily. Now I am sober. I haven't touched alcohol in five years. I have revamped my diet and poor eating habits. I go to the gym and practice yoga every morning. My sleep has improved. My mood has improved drastically with just some changes. I do not get irritated easily or feel helpless. I have also updated my resume and searched for a job that suits me. I earn a decent amount of money now. I receive compliments from people around me saying I look great. I have lost a lot of weight too. I thought my husband would be pleased, but he is not. He dislikes it when I receive compliments from others or when people compliment me in front of him. I didn't see it as a major issue. He used to joke about how people assume he is Adam Sandler who got the hot chick. I used to dismiss it as a joke. Then I found out he was cheating on me with a coffee shop waitress. I don't think her job title is important, but that girl doesn't seem nice to me. I have read some of the chats between her and my husband, and she described me as an old hag trying to fit in with the young. She lives with her parents and is a high school dropout. She is only 22 years old. I am heartbroken. I thought my husband would be happy. Our sex life has been better than ever. This affair has been going on for seven months. Despite me working more hours now, I still fulfill all my wifely duties. I cook for him, make his lunch for the office, and initiate sex and intimacy. Now here I am, getting a divorce from him. When I confronted him about the affair, he told me that being with me is always overbearing. He feels invisible because most people direct their attention towards me, and somehow this is my fault. I was preoccupied with myself instead of acknowledging how this made him feel. He feels insignificant because he's been stuck in the same spot for the past five years. I don't understand it. I never pressured him to follow my lead. I always reassured him that I loved him regardless. Why is this happening? I don't want my kids to grow up in a broken family, but I cannot live with him after what he has said and done. I know he's feeling insecure, but he didn't have to hurt me like this. I realize that surviving as a single mom is tough. People warned me that my husband could act differently towards me. They were right. I wish it didn't have to end this way. Update. Hello, everyone. I want to express my gratitude to all those who have supported and been kind to me. I know. People have PM'd me to inquire about how I am doing. I am managing fine. Yes, there is still pain, but things are progressing smoothly. I did get my son and daughter into therapy. My son understands why we are divorcing. He gets angry sometimes and has tantrums. My daughter is too young to comprehend anything. I just want to know how I can handle this. How can I help my son see that none of this is his fault but his father's? I do not want to keep any secrets from my kids because I believe the relationship between a couple affects the children too. I want him to have a good relationship with his dad, but I do not want him to learn any harmful lessons from this situation. The other day, I was watching the movie Family That Prays. I know this sounds silly, but I had this fear inside me. What if my son blames me for the divorce just like Andrea blamed her mother because her father left? What if he turns out just like his own father? I cannot control everything that goes on inside his head. I try my best to be there for my son, but the constant fear of losing him still persists. My father came to visit me. He resides in a different city. He only knows part of the truth. After learning the complete truth, he became very angry. When my ex-husband visited our children, my dad and he got into a huge argument. My dad slapped him. Since my dad used to be in the military, my ex-husband is terrified of him. He threatened to call the police, but my dad shouted, I am not afraid of a cockroach like you. I told my dad not to make things more complicated than they already are. I'm trying my hardest to maintain my daily routine. Sleeping has been difficult, but I do not want to rely on pills. On the bright side, I now have a lot more free time. I realize that half of my chores have been reduced. I know kids can be messy, but it feels like a huge relief. I do not have to clean crumbs off the table or deal
deal with water rings on the coffee table, which annoy me a lot. Things and belongings remain in their place. I started to notice that my husband was the one who created most of the mess, and I was the one cleaning it. Last week, I went to the theater with my son and daughter to watch Barbie. We were joined by my friend, who is also a single mom of two. I felt good wearing the replica of the cowboy costume that Margot Robbie wore, my friend's idea. We had a lot of fun. I am still trying my best to stay afloat, and I am not thinking about dating. I do not have the desire to date at the moment. I did get hit on in a few places, but nothing exciting. I will see you guys later. How can I, 22F, convince my husband, 37M, to understand, it was a marriage of convenience, that I genuinely love him? We tied the knot nearly four years ago because it was the only option for me to stay safe. My father was an abusive and extremely conservative man who raised me alone, making my childhood a dreadful experience. He was mentally ill, deeply religious, and began adhering to a religion and culture that weren't even ours, which changed him drastically. He didn't want me to have any form of interaction with boys, so I was homeschooled. When I was almost 19, I attempted to flee from home. After after discovering this, he did horrific things to me. That's when I met my now husband, who is a lawyer and was our neighbor. He tried to assist me, and thanks to him, I was able to attend college and find a safe place to live. However, this situation didn't last long because soon my father discovered where I was living. He and his friends, who practiced the same religion as him, started threatening my husband and me. To be honest, the laws in my country are ineffective. All I could manage was to get a restraining order. But every time he breached that order, no action was taken, not even by the police. What could they do? My father has influential friends who always bailed him out. So I ended up marrying my husband to move to his country and ensure my safety. In all these years, he never exploited me. He always treated me as if he were my mentor, continually encouraging me to attend college and secure a good job so that I could be self-reliant. In a way, I am now. I'll turn 23 this month. I graduated and I have a very well-paid job that I acquired myself, a job that allows me to rent an apartment and finally move out of his home. But I don't want to do that. I want to be his wife. I mean, his legitimate wife. He knows this because a few days ago, we had sex for the first time, and I told him I loved him. However, he said that isn't true, that I'm too young, and that I only claim to love him because he helped me in the past, and because he was the first man I slept with. But that's not true. I am grateful for everything he did for me, but I didn't fall in love with him because of that. I love him because over these years, I got to know him better, and I fell in love with everything about him. He is the sweetest, kindest, funniest, smartest, and most handsome man I have ever met. We discussed it extensively, and he told me that he loves me too, but that nothing will ever happen between us because of our age difference. He said it was best to forget what happened, but I don't want that. How can I make him understand that I genuinely love him and that I want to try to make this marriage truly work? Update. After my post, my husband, 38M, and I, 23F, discussed our future at length. He suggested that I move out and try to live my life independently for once, but I didn't want to. I told him that I was happy with the life I had with him and that I wanted our marriage to succeed. So after many discussions, we literally spent weeks talking about it. He's not very easy to persuade, haha. We decided to give it a try, and it worked really well. I started attending therapy because I realized I had some past wounds that needed healing, and it turned out to be the best choice I ever made in my entire life. So thanks to everyone who suggested I should seek therapy, it was the best advice I received. A few months after deciding to work on our marriage, I got pregnant, and therapy was the most helpful thing during that period. Because to be honest, when I found out it was not a joyous moment, I was terrified of becoming a horrible parent like mine. And if it hadn't been for therapy, I don't know if I would have come to understand that I am not them, and that my daughter will be safe with me and her dad because we both love her and will protect her from everything within our power. Also, quarantine made everything easier because we spent the entire day together, and it was definitely a great aid in strengthening our relationship. I really appreciated spending those months alone, just the two of us, because despite the minor arguments, not everything is perfect as it seems. I've fallen in love with him even more, and I'm 100% certain that I want to spend the rest of my life with him. And I know I don't love him for what he did for me in the past. I will always be grateful for that, but I don't love him for that. I love him because he is always trying to make me laugh with goofy jokes, because he is the sweetest and kindest man I have ever known. I love him because he is selfless, and because he always listens to me even when I know he has had a long and exhausting day, he is always there for me. But what makes me love him the most is seeing him so excited for our baby, knowing that soon we will be a family, the family I always dreamed of, melts my heart. So things are definitely better now, and I couldn't ask for anyone better to spend the rest of my life with. Thanks to all the people who sent me messages and gave me amazing advice, I appreciate it with all my heart, because that advice truly helped me.